Welcome to the show, Daniel and Greg. Great to see you both. Hey, good to be back, Tim. So, Daniel, you've been on the podcast. I did a little bit of research. Episode 90, How to Grow Your Studio Like a Pro. Uh, then episode 210, Why Studio Marketing Matters at Any Stage. And that was a replay from an amazing live stream that I saw you do. You were happy to let us mm. restream that, which was super cool. Uh, and I always get great feedback about the kinds of suggestions That's that good. you're making. So, and you're working as a coach for music studio owners, uh, particularly around the business admin and systems and marketing. How are you finding the general market for music lessons right now? I, I, I get the sense that some teachers are finding it pretty tough and then others seem to be having kind of blockbuster years. What's going on? Okay, it's a good question. Let me just start by saying that let's talk about the data of it all. So I work with a lot of students every year, hundreds, and in the process of working with them, at least the ones I work on in marketing, which is a subset of that hundreds, I have access to their metrics. So I'm seeing data come in from all over the United States, all over Australia, Europe, and can compare that trend-wise to previous years. And what I would say is that the only significant change that I've seen is probably just around that ad costs in general have drifted up over time. And even as I look back at clients that I worked with in 2017, 2018, you know, pre-pandemic and all that sort of thing, even within those studios, provided their budget stayed the same, they were largely getting the same number of impressions on their ads, the same number of clicks, the same number of people coming to their site through their ads. Um, and when I look at their sites in general, you know, again, I see a fairly consistent number. And that's a pretty cool thing when you can look back over the course of half a decade and look at the the number of people visiting their site, look at the number of people actually filling out the form in their site to contact them and say, wow, it's actually been remarkably consistent and steady even through the pandemic year. And, and I'll, you know, toss it back over to you in a, in a second, Tim, as soon as I say this, but even the pandemic year, there were folks that they lost a lot of students right at the beginning of the pandemic because of the change. And then they just had a whole new influx of students come in because there was kind of a disruption. So I would say that this is yet again, another place where people, if you're glass half empty kind of person versus a glass half full, you might have one person might be overly optimistic, the other might be overly pessimistic, but the data doesn't lie. So you can let that kind of temper your thoughts and either help you to be encouraged or, you know, to be, I guess I would want to say unencouraged if you're more optimistic. If you're more optimistic, just let it go, you know, keep going that way. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I just don't know if I see such a massive change in things that we're in some kind of new milieu. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's 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 interesting to hear. Um, I, in fact, you just reminded me, I got some feedback from one of our members, Christina shared that she's finally got back to her pre pandemic student level and said, thanks to mm -hmm. top music it's less stressful than it was pre pandemic because she's now got systems and power. Uh, we've got our power hours and systems in place to make things nice. easier. So that is super cool. So I have a feeling there's, it's a different, a different new, but perhaps as you're mm -hmm. saying, maybe it's, well, there's always going to be people who are having ups and downs, but maybe it's kind of leveling back where it maybe was before. What about you, Greg? Mm. What have you sort of seen and heard around the place? As far as numbers, I I um, am a studio owner, so I, uh, I'm i not a coach. Uh, so I can just tell you what's happening on my runway. Um, we did lose uh, about 30% of our student, students um, at the beginning of the pandemic. We had to go completely online and that wasn't gonna work with all of our families. Um, and it took some time to build back, uh, but we are definitely back to pre-pandemic numbers. I think I think that it's back to life as usual now. Um, and uh, I, in fact, our numbers are slightly better than they've ever been. There was, as I expected, uh, I, I was expecting you know, when when the doors started to reopen on, in communities, everyone was really anxious after two years of kind of hunkered down, you know, everyone was mm -hmm. anxious to get back to regular life. And there were so many parents that that, that were holding their kids and they're like, okay, now we're right. gonna go out and, and we're gonna do everything. And and piano and music education was one of those things. And, and we saw kind of just a, a, a spike in, um, in it in enrollment and then that's kind of held strong since then mm. oh, that's great to hear well we're going to hear more about greg and what you've been up to but the way i actually met and heard about greg was through a podcast daniel that you've started with a mate of yours called nate 
uh, which mm -hmm. is called the Seven Figure Music Studio. So how did you guys start working together? Well, as our podcast name suggests, Nate is so the podcast actually the is owner. Called the Seven Figure Music Studio, for those who aren't sure. Yeah, Seven Figure Music School is the name of the music podcast. And, yeah, and the way Nate and I were connected was that I had been on a, on a, another podcast in the industry in late 2019, and Nate actually reached out to me because of that podcast. They have an enormous school in Brooklyn, New York, uh, pre-pandemic. Um, they were well over seven figures in revenue a year, and they hired me to come in and help them with their marketing systems. So I came in, I worked with their marketing, internal marketing team. I worked with him as a CEO. We worked for a good portion of 2020. I helped them through the pandemic. I helped them get a bunch of funnels up that helped them start their online program. And as I was working with Nate, I just had this sense that I've worked with a lot of big schools, but I never worked with a school that ran like such a well-oiled machine. And I was impressed with just their systems and all these things internally. So even after my work with him was done, I continued to stay in touch with Nate. And I said, hey, what if we started a podcast where we just start talking about some of, you know, something that we both love, which is running a systems-based business. In my opinion, a systems-based business is superior to any other kind of business because it does, the systems do a lot of the work for you. Um, and so Nate being kind of the poster child for that and me, you know, kind of being the coach, we kind of had this perfect relationship where it was like Nate was kind of a content expert at all this stuff. And I kind of had the coaching and marketing piece and um, he kind of had the hiring piece and just together we felt that we could create something better than what either one of us could create alone. So we started this podcast, it aired, first episode aired December 1st of 2021. And Nate and I actually just finished recording episode 61 this past week, uh, which will air a couple months from it. Yeah. Um, so we've been at it really hard. We've had Sarah Campbell on the podcast. I know she's been on your podcast. Yeah, we've Sarah. had, um, yeah, we've ha obviously had Greg on there. Um, but let me even say something. People hear that name, like Seven Figure Music School. And, you know, while yes, there are seven figure schools out there and there are mid sized schools that might want to grow to that. While that is the case, really the focus of the, our work is not so much on, oh, everyone needs to have a seven-figure business. That really isn't it. Really, kind of the deeper mission there is, can we help a school owner run their school in a sustainable way that doesn't take a lot of time, that doesn't completely dominate their life? We went to music school. We didn't go to music. We went to music school to get a degree so that we could teach music, so that we could inspire, so that we could educate. We didn't go so that we could spend 40 hours a week doing admin and hiring and recruiting. Right. And so whether you are a single teacher studio that has maybe an assistant or whether you've got a staff of 20, I want, it's kind of my personal mission. Like what are the things that I can help other people do so that they can focus on only the aspects of the job that they truly, truly love and find ways to automate, delegate, or eliminate things that that don't <laughs> spark joy, that right. don't bring joy, you know? Larry <laughs> Kondo would be impressed, yes. Right, right. Yeah. So so that that's kind of, you know, again, the, the podcast title is provocative, but there is kind of a deeper thoughtfulness to that. And, and that's kind of um, my thoughts around that. Yeah, it's almost more to the point would be, you know, building a, a systems-based school or something mm -hmm. like that that because that's yeah. what i get when i listen to your episodes and mm. i i i like being reminded systems 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 automation systems right. um just so important and if i if i go back and look look back we're we're up to episode 300 and i don't know what at the moment if i go back to the first ones one of the first people i hired in my business was someone that could look after the podcast. So all I had to do mm -hmm. was find the guest and record the interview and then have the system take over after that. And so I built this process whereby I put this in Dropbox and someone knows what to do with that. And then it gets edited and then the show notes are made and it published all this kind of stuff. And that that is a system. And we still use that system today. It's changed the, the people that are doing it and some of the technology has changed, but the system has remained the same. And so I really, I really encourage teachers listening the more you can systemize things in your studio. So you're not doing the same thing from scratch every time the better because of course the next step once you've got the system is can some software help you or can a VA or an assistant of some sort help yeah. you run the system and I think that's yeah. that's one of the key things that you work with studios on 
Yeah. And I'll say like, you know, Tim, you couldn't run something like Top Music Pro or this podcast and all the things you've got going on if you didn't have awesome systems in place. So I know you're You've got all that stuff down. Could always be improved, though. That's what I always yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, look, Greg's been very quiet there. But, Greg, I want to um, dive in and, and find out a bit more about what you're doing because um, we want to talk about group teaching. Uh, it's mm-hmm. become quite popular of late, even though we've been talking about it for, well, more than a decade, I think, particularly. And, Daniel, you, you used to run your own studio. Greg, you do mm-hmm. run a group teaching studio. So, um, now, Greg, I'm, I've heard about you and um, your program on uh, Nate and Daniel's podcast. So you've built a curriculum and a system for running group studios, which you're building mm-hmm. at grouplessons.com. Um, why do you th- why do you guys, I don't know who, who wants to take this, why is group lessons, it seems to be gaining a bit of track, a bit more traction than usual right now. Why is that? I can jump in and just weigh in, Daniel, if you want to add. I think that there's two things that just come to mind and and i can only guess you know why why are so so many people who wouldn't have considered you know a a teaching environment now considering it i think that the pandemic forced a lot of teachers to to change their environment a lot of a lot of teachers went from in person to online you know against their will they you know and and i think just having our community of music educators see a major change, but then nothing blew up. Education kept working, it kept going forward. I think it's kind of rattled a lot of people free. There's a freedom in that to think, well, if that can change, maybe other things can change. Because piano has been taught for hundreds of years now, 400 years, one teacher, one child, one room, one piano. And that's the way it's looked and that's the tradition that's still the tradition that's still the way most teachers are going to continue teaching this year but there's also this new thing that we all saw if you take that away and change the environment it still works and so a lot of teachers are are looking at group lessons as like something that well maybe you know if online lessons works maybe group lessons will work too the other thing I would say is people are always encouraged when they see someone else succeed, right? People started breaking the four minute mile after one person broke the four minute mile um, and started getting broken on a regular basis because one person did it. And I it think- It impossible, right? Right, right. It, it, it was believed to be impossible, but then it happened. And, and I think the more we see studios successfully create a group lesson program that creates great results because i think that's the big skepticism with the teachers that are uh, that have been teaching you know that traditional way and i say that by experience because i was a skeptic uh, of group lessons for a long time i didn't believe that it was uh an environment that was going to produce top level students but the more we see it you know the proof is in the pudding you know it's in the results we see other people do it we're like oh okay someone just did it well, I now I now I can't argue with it's it's possible, you know, and and so I think now that our community of teachers are waking up to the reality that you can have great results, a great environment in group lessons, um, people are curious and a lot of people are willing to give it a try. I would even have one thing on top of that, mm-hmm. not in a, not in opposition to Greg, but but you make such a good point that. When I started blogging in twenty early 2016, so Grow became a thing in February of 2016, and no small part to you even, Tim, because you looked at one of those first resources I gave away and you gave it an endorsement. I know that was really helpful early on along with Joy Moore. And there was just so much less visibility at that time. There was so There was so much less support available. If you think back to the mid-2010s, really our industry was just beginning to... to, to Come online, I would almost say. Like, obviously, you'd been around, Joy had been around, the DAOs had been around. But if you compare now, this moment, to that moment just seven years ago, there is just an explosion and a plethora of tools and resources and coaches and preschool curriculums, all kinds of things. Yeah. And everyone is so much more connected. And I think going to what Greg said, um, back then, it might have been difficult to get information on group lessons. It might have been difficult to get information on digital marketing. That is not the case anymore. So we're really building on the shoulders of giants. We're building on all this shared uh, knowledge, this collaborative knowledge that's been put out into the space for free. And 
and I think people are building on top of that. The the time that it takes to begin experimenting or doing things differently, just th that learning curve is much shorter for people now because of the the abundance of tools and resources out there. Mm, I agree. Greg, you mentioned the skepticism of teachers. I think there's also a skepticism in parents as well, to some extent. Uh, mm -hmm. And regardless of how many uh, football trainings, dance classes their children do in group formats, mm -hmm. there still can be somewhat of a stigma for particularly for parents who experience the one on one lesson themselves, that this yep. isn't this is second class somehow. This is not right. the premium. How, how do you go about uh, helping parents understand that better? Well, um, for me personally, my studio, um, we will take we we teach students that are in the method book stage in group lessons. Mm -hmm. We do eventually transition our students to, to private lessons and we will take our committed students and we put them in uh, standardized testing. We put them in competitions and we are certainly not the studio that like needs to win at every competition, but we stand shoulder to shoulder with the studios that do. And, uh, and so our, our students, we, we, again, I just come back to results. If parents are skeptical of the environment, I always go back and I say, well, but look at these results, you know, mm -hmm. look at these students that we produced. Here's our, we, we have on our webpage, just a, a few videos of students in the last couple of years that have, you know, performed in, in some, competitive and, and judge venues and have done well. And, and uh, we just, we steer them there. That has taken time for us. That doesn't happen overnight, but um, it, it's humbling. In the last two weeks, we've had three families walk in off the street. I never met them. I didn't know who they were, but they came to me and they said, we're ready to start piano. And we've heard that the Piano Express is the place to be, you know? And, and so, Reputation, um, it takes it takes time. I would say that that is a long war and not a quick battle that you have to win. Um, yeah, for, and for teachers who want to change, it's always you know one of the big questions. You know, how do I do this? How do I uh, notify the parents? How do we let them know when there's no results in my studio yet? Uh, and right. for the ones, the ones that I've coached through, it's a matter of starting with a small group. So just start with one group, maybe take four of your kids, mm -hmm. put them together, explore it, try it out, see how it goes, and then use those results to encourage others in if that's one of the ways you want to go. But then there are other teachers who just go, right, I'm changing the whole thing. <laughs> you either stick yeah. with me or, or you're out. And now we're just doing groups. And I've interviewed Christina Whitlock. I'm thinking did that this, the start of this year, she's got her podcast and, uh, and she's, it's quite revolutionized her, um, well, all sorts of elements um, around her time, scheduling, income, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I, w I would say that, um, and I, I'm only saying things that I've heard Daniel say that I just, I, he said it first, but I completely agree. That fear of what the parents are going to think is almost always gonna be much stronger in the mind of the teacher than it is in the reality of the parent. Uh, most parents, you know, they're busy. They've got their kids in a lot of activities and the piano teacher says, okay, we're going to start doing group lessons instead of one-on-one. -on -one. Most parents are going to be like, fine, it's great. You know, and the teacher's like, oh, I wonder what the parents are going to think. I hope this doesn't ruin my career. <laughs> and um, yeah, usually when teachers, well, I would say it's always a good move if teachers do what they know is best for them and for their career. If you're taking care of yourself, you're going to be a better teacher for it and your career, your students, everything's going to trickle down and your service to your community is going to be better for it. So if it's a move that you believe is going to help you, you know, don't, don't listen to your fear, uh, do, do what is right. Mm. I want to dive into your um, group lessons program because this is actually, as Daniel said, there's more and more group lesson programs out there. And I remember interv interviewing Mayron Cole, one of the earliest pioneers who yeah. retired and just gave away all her stuff. Uh, and, and a number of other people have started creating resources and curriculums for uh, group lessons. So I'm keen to hear what uh, what's different, how yours works. Can you give mm -hmm. us a bit of a, a inside scoop on it all? Yeah, well, I'll I'll start by going back to my 
problems with group lessons before I started teaching group lessons. Um, right. I was running a summer camp and uh, actually Daniel and I, we go way back. Yeah. So we were running the summer camp together. Together oh, in the mid 2000s. Daniel, you've told yep. me about your summer camps. That's where it all started, yeah. right? So with so Greg, we getting, yep. We were getting, oh, I was okay. getting now a I'm lot of students. Okay. A lot of students were interested in, in me as a teacher, more students than I could take. And I didn't want a wait list. Um, it really bothered me because I had these, I was teaching all one-on-one -on -one lessons. I had some students that were committed, honestly, some students that were not, some students that I had to sit with and wait for the time to be, <laughs> you know, every, you know, te students that don't want to learn piano, but the parents are making them, they don't practice. Every teacher's been through that. It's, you mm -hmm. know, and then, it would drive me crazy that, and then I have a wait list. I have the, I don't know if this next student that I can't even fit into my schedule is going to be the next Mozart, but what, what can I do? You know, I can't even meet with them. And so I really wanted to do group lessons to, to just be able to get kids off my wait list and be able to say yes to everyone. I am a yes person uh, to a fault. And, uh, but I held my ground for two reasons. Number one, um, I saw group lessons as a huge time management problem for teachers. I, I imagined a bunch of students in a circle and a teacher just going around the circle. Okay, let me listen to your song. Okay, everyone else, I'll be there. Wait your turn. Okay, good. Nope, this is, fix this. Okay, let me play it for you. Okay, guys, I'll be there in a minute. Wait your turn. You know, and then I get around the circle and after an hour, everyone's gotten a few minutes of my time. And I'm just like, that, that doesn't, I can't do that. That's not... Um, that's not even glorified babysitting. That's thievery, <laughs> you know, if I'm charging money for that. And so I just, I wouldn't, like, that's how I envision group lessons is, is like this, like the, the, we're losing so much time with me and the students. That's number one. The other thing is there was, there was logistical problems. Every method out there that I've ever seen, um, you start kids at the beginning, right? Here's middle C, here's the white key, black key pattern. Here's a steady beat and let's let's build a few melodies. Okay, we're a few weeks in, now we're playing Yankee Doodle and Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. And then the phone rings. Hey, can we start your program? Oh, well, we're already five weeks in, you know? And, and so now what do I say to this student? Either I bring them in and then it dilutes the content of the class, or I tell that that family, oh well, we'll we'll start our next semester in another ten weeks. Well, that gives or is four or five, whatever it is, that gives that family several weeks to call every other studio in town <laughs> yep. and find because they're calling you today. They want to start today, and so there was those logistical problems, time management problems, and I just I wouldn't budge. I was like, I'm going to keep teaching one on one lessons until I figure this out. Okay. Fast forward, I'm not gonna give you the whole long story on how I came to it, but after a lot of brainstorming, trial and error, um, we believe at the Piano Express and at grouplessons.com, we have solved these fundamental challenges. And I don't wanna say that they're problems, they are challenges because there are teachers that teach through these challenges and still have different measures of success. But we have faced these challenges head on. Okay, we've dealt with the time management issue with technology. We have all of our pianos connected to through a software to to our web platform, the Piano Express, um, play.thepianoexpress.com. And um, students can play along with background tracks and they can get graded. The, the software gives them feedback on how uh, accurate their performance is. And so it gamifies things for students and it and it is a huge time management tool for teachers. We can set a group of students in a row, in a circle, and we can say, okay, everybody plug in and go. And I can start checking scores. I don't have to listen to everything in real time while we're in our, what I call our assessment phase, which is not the whole class. It's just the first half of class uh, for the first 30 minutes. Everyone's doing assessment and it's so efficient it's done all at once. Everyone's simultaneously working through, did I practice properly? Am I ready for new songs? Um, uh, what do my new songs sound like? Everything that would have to happen in real time in single file without technology, we do simultaneously. Then I have a whole th 30 minutes left in the hour to just teach. And that's wonderful. I take a bunch of beginners and we teach theory, we teach technique. I do what Daniel said earlier in the podcast, I do 
what I went to school to do, to music school to do, to be a teacher. Um, and that does spark joy in me every, every day. Um, and uh, so with the time management issue, we, we have a software solution. With the phone call five weeks into our program, what are we going to do with that? We very, very carefully thought through the way we introduce concepts at the Piano Express in our method. This is one of the things that makes us unique. We call it a revolving door as opposed to an escalator. Okay, every, every method out there works like an escalator. You teach one concept, then in the next unit, you review that concept and you build onto it. You teach a third concept, fourth concept, and you just build and build and build and it, you go up like an escalator. And that makes total sense. That's perfectly fine if you're teaching a one-on-one -on -one lesson, but everyone that's ever taught group knows that that's a problem fundamentally in group lessons because children are going to go at different paces. Some child's going to finish the book and go to level two before someone else. Um, and if you have a level two class, do you make What'd that? You do you make the student wait for everyone else? Do you send them into the middle of level two and they've missed half the book? So what we've done is we've written all of our lesson plans like a sitcom writer writes sitcom episodes. You can enter and exit at any time, even though there's a longer story being told across the semester. We introduce concepts one at a time and we trade them in and out instead of building them on top of each other. And um, every lesson starts with a fundamental core. There's there's core concepts that you need to know to be in that level even at the very beginning our, our level one for example the core is just steady beat finger numbers alphabet letters we do a b c d e f g on the on the keys um and uh and that's it and so we review that core every week every week we do the core and then we do one other concept not a stack one mm -hmm. and that concept changes every four weeks and every 12 weeks we cycle around. So the, the, um, the cycle takes three, three months, 12 weeks. Um, so Greg, you mind if I jump in? Please do. Cause so I, I believe in this so much, but my own son's taking through this method. Um, mm -hmm. and what I observed and, and how it looks different from another method is that, um, if you're in week eight, let's say you're not seeing, you're only seeing the concept for that part of the core. And then when you move into that kind of that back third, you don't see those other concepts. So Greg, what's that fancy term? Um, accumulation, right? Accumulation, right? Accumulation. Yeah. So every method has accumulation. It's just, we're doing accumulation differently. And that's what allows students to go in and out at will. So you might have a child get through level two really, really quickly. Like let's say in nine weeks, they can shoot immediately into week 10 of level three and only have to work with that concept right there. And because of how we've built the method, uh, they're not going to be hopelessly behind or, you know, kind of drowning because there's such an Im immense skill jump needed to make that right. transition. It feels very smooth. I tell parents, instead of thinking about an escalator, think about six revolving doors, all stacked on top of each other. You can enter and exit at any point. And as soon as you complete your cycle, as soon as you get all the way through the material, you shoot through the ceiling, which will be the floor on the next level. And then you're going around that cycle and you can enter and exit at any point on the second level, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. And we have six levels. That's, that's how we take children through students that's how we take them through the elementary stage of piano mm. the, well, you're, you're now on, me. Oh, i was i was gonna say sorry tim uh, uh, do you want to do you want to go ahead or, or yeah, you go you go well i was just gonna say on the business side of things what that translates to is because the system is so efficient and because of kind of this unique structure um, what that's allowed a lot of people who, because there's an increasing number of schools that are using this, um, it allows practically a studio to see 12 kids an hour with just one teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and we even have we even have schools doing this that are that have two teachers running this and they can see 24 kids an hour with this and still produce students that are doing really, really well, like an RC, RCM or kind of the Australian equivalent AMEB. Mm. But let me kick it back over to you because I, I I just wanted to, I just wanted to throw in that little business thing there. <laughs> right. Does does the revolving uh, concept 
mean that it's slower though? Okay, good question. So um, we have a revolving door concept that allows open enrollment at every level year round. But the software component, when we put that together, we have our students, we tell all of our students, you move from level one to level two, not when you sit through 12 weeks or, or complete a semester. You actually move from level one to level two when you get a passing score on the software in mm -hmm. your songbook. Okay. That makes sense. When so you can demonstrate are... that you are at that level, you can move up. You know, it's not a time right. thing, it's a skill based. Yeah. And so <laughs> it's it's actually incredibly efficient. Students are working in group lessons, but they are truly self-paced. Okay. Um, we just saw this this month, we just saw one of our uh, um biggest sometimes we see we see like rare uh successes we had a girl uh she showed up this she she's maybe 10 years old she's very nervous on the open house we 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 do like an open house session instead of a trial lesson we want to introduce families to our system mm -hmm. she wouldn't make eye contact with me she wouldn't put on her headphones she wouldn't touch the piano she wouldn't talk to me um and i but but i i was engaging her and her mom at the same time kind of giving them some space she came back her first week took the book home next week, finished, completed. <laughs> she, we have tutorial videos in, built into the app. So if students work ahead, they can sort of see snapshots of what are in the class. And we just immediately let her go to level two after one week. Now there's going to be people listening to this podcast are like, but, but then what happened? Did they miss lesson plans? Did they, did they miss concepts? Yeah, the same as like here in in the US, like when students sometimes in, in elementary school, teachers will say this student can skip third grade, let's send them straight to fourth grade, you know, what about what about like the specific like things that are covered in history and science that they, yeah, they miss it, but they're okay. <laughs> they need to be up a level, they're ready for it. Um, they figured it out. Okay, and so, yeah. uh, she came back the next week, and she finished her second book. Wow. And so we sent her straight to level three. And I've seen this happen a few times. It works. Um, if anyone, I'll, I'll just, if anyone wants to uh, go through the trouble, if you go to our, our studio website, www.thepianoexpress.com, you will see um, one of our links is performances. Okay. Uh, one of those performers at the bottom of the page, his name's Ethan. He's only been playing the piano for 15 months. That was it. He shot through. Uh, he missed tons of classes because uh, because he was just graduating before we could bring him through a whole cycle. Uh, but um, he's uh, studying now. He did leave our studio to study at uh, the Peabody Conservatory. He's in uh, mm -hmm. high school now, but he doesn't even go to regular school. He's like so committed to music. Wow. Brilliant. Yeah. I, I wanted to speak to one more thing about the the speed piece, which again, with collaborating with Greg on Piano Express and GroupLossons.com and then having my own son go through it and kind of see it on a week to week basis for your average student, what I love so much about this, because Tim, you know, I taught group lessons for nearly 15 years. I didn't teach it in this particular way. Mm. Um, I kind of had at the time what I thought was probably the best conception of group lessons possible until I, I kind of ran into Greg's system um, five years ago. My, my point is this, though, that in all lesson structures, whether one-on-one -on -one or group, progress is tied to presence with the teacher. In other words, the teacher is the gatekeeper of the student moving forward. Mm -hmm. What I loved about my son's piano experience over the last year or two, he probably passed 90% of his song. Now, he's taking online, I should say that. Um, but that is kind of I guess that's immaterial to the point at hand because whether he was taking it online or whether he was going into the studio and, and doing it in person, he was passing probably 80 to 90% of his songs outside of the lesson because the software component allowed him to move forward. And what I saw then was something different from even some of my elite students back in the day when I was still teaching. And that is that he truly owned his own progress. It wasn't like, oh, the teacher is going to pass it for me. Like it for him, it was a game. It was me against the machine, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing about how, you know, the grading component works that that kind of strips away 
um, something that's going to hinder him long term. It, it isn't going to hinder him long term. Anyway, I just kind of wanted to put that there because again, that's if there was that s- concern about speed, that's just something that I think it's uh, it, it wasn't something that held my son back. Anyway, just yeah. I'm I'm interested, and I have a feeling other teachers, particularly one-on-one teachers, will be thinking this. Uh, what about technique? If uh, if students tend to rush through, they can they can make a lot of progress in the first couple of years, and then things rapidly start slowing down because they haven't got the basics uh, right. of movement fast enough, and they get then they get stuck. Right. Yeah, there are things that machines can do that people can't do. And there are things that people do that, at least here in 2023, machines still can't do um, as well as we can. Um, and I think teaching technique is something that definitely needs a human component. I I do a lot of thinking, like how can we create the most efficient system? You, It's like a hybrid of real people and technology. Okay, so the Piano Express is not like some of those softwares out there that are DIY, you know, you just download the app and learn piano. That's not what we are, but we use software in conjunction with real people. And we, the need for real people is, is at its clearest when it comes to technique. Um, Every week we um, in, in our second half of class, we, we tell everyone, okay, halfway through the hour, you turn off the machines, uh, we, everyone unplugs and we just talk about theory and we talk about technique for, for 30 minutes. Um, a lot of, I'll say this, a lot of one-on-one teachers are teaching 30 minute lessons as opposed to one hour lessons. And in that 30 minutes, you need to do all of your assessment. You need to listen to the child. Did they practice? Are they ready for new songs? Here's what your new songs sound like. Here's, you need to keep the song for another week. Here's the changes that need made. And then whatever time's left, 10 minutes, 15, sometimes less, you try to, teach some technique or, and, and I know you can build technique into all of your assessment too. And that happens, but just to focus, step away from the assessment and just look at technique square in the face. We do that every week and we have more than enough time to do it. And so again, back to results, the students that go through the piano express system, they have sound technique. Um, we, um, uh, I, I, I always go back to results. Um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, here in the United States, the um, uh, one of the m- most recognized, if not the most recognized standardized testing is the RCM, the Royal Conservatory of Music. Uh, one of our students just two years ago won the, the uh, national gold medal. She scored the highest in the country. She had never played an acoustic piano. She had never been in a one-on-one lesson. She was learning in group wow. lessons on digital pianos and her technique was sound enough to get the highest score in the United States. So this just flies in the face of like people that are that that believe that there's only one way to teach piano, um, and and it's the traditional way. We're we're just the proof is in the pudding. Uh, mm. There's there's more than one way to do it. I was glad to hear in your one hour lessons, which are longer than most. Let's let's be honest that that's a change as well. I was glad to hear that at least half the lesson isn't about individual work on mm-hmm. a, on a device. So in that half an hour, you mentioned theory and technique and that sort of thing. Do you play together? Because that's one of the most fundamental fun parts of group teaching to me. Is that, is that part of it? Or is that something that teachers could supplement? We, we do play together, yeah. There's, there's lesson plans. And the nice thing about becoming a Piano Express teacher um, and you know any, anyone that wants to learn more about becoming a Piano Express teacher you know, at grouplessons.com, we, get, we train everyone with, with lesson plans. We give them like, yeah, every, everything's cut out. You know, there, there's definitely room for every teacher to put their personality into it, but, but there's sight reading, ear training, um, but then yes, playing together in unison, listening to each other, um, all of that is built into the lesson plans every week. That's great. Yeah. It sounds like uh, <laughs> definitely a, a, a lot of problems are solved uh, and you really, you, you labeled the, the two, the two big ones. Well, that, the, the biggest one is the leveling one. And mm-hmm. so far for teachers who aren't using the software in this system, they either decide to do multi-level or multi-age groups and mm-hmm. use a curriculum that suits that, which suits some teachers, or you stick to one level. But then you have that issue of what happens when people come late, what happens when people progress too fast. 
Uh, so there are always challenges. So I think it's fantastic that you've thought so thoroughly about this and then gone and solved those issues. Uh, and the software must be quite um, comprehensive, uh, I must say. This must have taken some <laughs> some creating. Would that be right? Five years. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's it, it, we believe that the best is certainly still to come. We are... Um, we are hoping as we gain traction and more people come on board, we'll, you know, with, with better funding comes better pro products. And we have, we have, we have a great thing today and we think we're going to have a better thing tomorrow. Yeah, it's great. Well, look, I'm um, keeping an eye on the time. I'm going to start wrapping things up a little bit. And I thought it might be fun to finish with uh, a, a bit of a sort of top three list. And I wondered if you could give our, whether teachers are teaching one-on-one -on -one or groups at the moment, what would be the top three changes that will have an impact on your studio in 2023 list? Uh, Dan, yes. What do you think? Yeah. Top three changes. Yeah. Um, top three considerations, maybe. Consider. Yeah. Now that I resonate with, I like that. Um, <laughs> so let me just actually the piggyback on what Greg just said there, the idea of the product and as music teachers, I know for me, it was a, it took a mind shift. It took a change of perspective to begin seeing myself as that business owner um, and not just as a teacher. And obviously for the music school owner, it's a little bit easier to kind of view that because you do have a lot more pressure on you and a lot more considerations to have uh, in running a business with a commercial location. But I think the theme for me, kind of going back to what I was saying earlier, is that so there are so many more resources right now for teachers. And so I think for me, as I'm looking forward in the decade that we're in, I'm thinking about simplicity. I'm thinking about what are the core components that have to be there. So I'm I'm going to give three, like, like you said, Tim. Um, first one is product. And that is just the, the delivery of the promise that you've made to that parent or that adult student who's come through your door. Um, in my opinion, this is actually the most important one. I know people kind of know me as the group lessons guy, the marketing guy, but at the core of that, the reason my marketing worked so well was because the product was so good and just in my own personal studio. And so I think that if you have something fundamentally at the core that that is providing an amazing experience for people, it just makes everything else in business so much easier. And look, I, I realize that's really, really general, but I think that there are things that people can do to make that that core component of what your studio is much, much better. And it doesn't necessarily have to do with like, you know, the games you play with the kids or that sort of thing. It really just comes down to what kind of impact are you having? Are you making it feel, and this is my huge thing in my own studio, are you making it feel easy for that child? Because if it feels easy for them, they're going to keep coming back. They will stay for a long, long time. So the first one I think is just that focus on the product, creating something that parents can't say no to. Second thing would just be in growth. And to keep it simple, there's all kinds of information and advice out there about marketing. Right now, again, more resources than ever. And I would just boil it down to one thing. One simple, let's just call it a funnel that you know how to track and that you know it's working correctly. Mm -hmm. There is so much marketing advice out there. And I know I'm guilty for part of that. You know, we're making more content than ever about marketing. But when it really, when it really boils down to it, you have one primary way that you master to predictably get calls or form fills or social media messages every week. Now, I happen to be quite partial to Google ads. I've been preaching this for like seven years now to the point that I think people just start making fun of me because I don't ever change my tune, but it still really is the very best way. And I think it really has broken through because seven years ago, I had to convince people that they, should, that they shouldn't be afraid of it. Now, when people get on a call with me to evaluate their marketing, you know, like to have like a free intake session with me, um, they're already talking about it. So in that sense, I feel like my job has... Um, 
that I've done a good job of kind of spreading the gospel of Google ads, so to speak. Um, <laughs> but getting good at it, that's something else entirely. And that's something that we still really help studios do. Um, there was a studio in a very, very tough competitive market in the United States and New York that came to us. Their studio was on the verge of collapse in, in late 2020. Um, and they went from barely getting contacts. They were a commercial school too, too with a big rent to um, within the last couple of months, they're getting anywhere from 40 to 70 leads per month just because they've kind of followed our our marketing progression and they're, they want massive and rapid growth. And um, of course, they've got a pretty big advertising budget for it, but it's just one of those things that this advice applies equally to the single teacher studio and to the big commercial studio. So that's the second one. Before I jump to the third, Tim, do you want to, do you have any questions about any of that stuff or should I just go to the third one? No, but I think it's uh, only to say that I think it's good that you're sort of keeping in mind that, yeah, the, the goal of music teachers isn't always growth. There are plenty of teachers out there yeah. who are quite comfortable with a small studio and that works for them. So... Yes. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I could see you're itching to say something. Go. <laughs> <laughs> well, all I was going to say is that um, for me, I had a, a bigger studio than most single teacher si private studios just because I was teaching group. But I did hit a point where I capped and I didn't want more students. I, mm. My dream was never to have 15, 20 teachers working for me or have a commercial location. I really loved what I had going on and it was just so perfect. Um, but because I had that system in place for me, I only needed a handful of stu new students per year. And I would get 200 requests, but what that allowed me to do was be in high demand. And I think every teacher, whether you want 20 students or 200, you know what that demand means. It means you get to handpick your students. It means you get to raise your rates more aggressively than other folks. Not that we're trying to, you know, not that we're just cynically after the money or whatever, but it's good to make a good living when you do a good job at what you do. Uh, and so for me, I didn't spend all that much time on the marketing. Uh, by the time that I kind of had all this set up and, and just, um, yeah, I really appreciate that because I'm not about growth at all costs, but I think that there is a place for being good at that component of your business, whether you are a small student, I want to say that way, or you're a big one. So yeah, that's just because it gives you, it gives you flexibility. You can choose. I yeah. remember listening to you. Oh my goodness. It would be three or four years ago on a Facebook live. Uh, and it still resonates with me that if you mm -hmm. do have a wait list, a short or small wait list or demand, as you say, you can pick and choose your students. And there are lots of teachers who complain on yes. groups about students yeah. that they really shouldn't be teaching, but they feel they have to because there's no one else ready to take their place. Mm -hmm. And so I think what, what you're trying to say is even if you're not looking to grow huge, uh, the marketing tips that you share and that others share can help you at least get to a position where you can, as you say, raise your rates or at least charge what you're really worth and gives you the flexibility to pick and choose your students a bit more, which is, which is great for enjoying your teaching more. All right. What's the third one, Daniel? Yeah. So, yeah, I talked about focusing on the product and then focusing on growth. And the third one, focus on yourself. This is something that I've seen, especially in the last couple of years, because Again, going back to that theme of there's just so much information out there. There's so much support out there that now we're in a position where people realize the information is there. And I'm, I, I just feel like I see a lot more teachers stressing out about all of the choice that's available to them. So before it used to be like, I don't know how to get students. Now it's the anxiety of, I don't know how to get students. And should it be Google ads? Or this person said social media, this person said TikTok, this person said I should start a podcast for my studio. This, I, I feel like I see more anxiety as I talk to usually about a half dozen new studio owners a week, just I get on a call with them, or maybe it's a studio owner I'm already working with. And in this day of, I think, increased anxiety, you know, if, if you're plugged into the popular culture, just... It isn't a controversial statement to say that anxiety is an all-time high for the human race right now. Just all the studies show that, all that sort of thing. Um, I don't know if I would have said this 10 years ago. Maybe this is just a sign that I'm getting older. But I say take a step back, focus on yourself, be really, really, really clear on what it is that you want for your students, for yourself, for your career. Become crystal clear on that and then just block out everything else. And one of the pieces of advice that I gave, um, 
actually i think she's been on your podcast um jana carlson mm. i think yeah um when she was first starting group lessons like five six years ago she was just talking about the kind of the stress and anxiety of switching over to group kind of speaking about what you'd asked greg earlier and i said you know what you shouldn't be thinking about group at 10 30 at night because that was something that that she was kind of doing i was like be the ceo once a week and this is what i do actually on sunday nights i take an hour or two out and i look at the big picture of my life of the business of all that i've got going on and i allow myself to like to let a lot of thoughts that i don't allow during my work week in and just evaluate everything as a whole and then i'm a drone through the week maybe not that extreme but i try to be that as much as possible i'm just executing and what I see from a lot of people that I work with is just this constant self-doubt, this constant questioning, wondering if they should be doing this, that, and, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you know, all the way down the list. Oh, all these things I should do. Should I start a preschool program? Should I do group lessons? There's just this, just shut it down. Just focus on yourself. Be really clear on what it is you want. Take a vacation with yourself, maybe, and just sit with a pen and paper in a quiet room get really clear on what it is you want and then just block it all out. That's been extremely helpful for me. And um, yeah, those are my three product growth and yourself. Those are, those are the three considerations, the three focuses I think that can really, really help people. Thanks Daniel. CEO Sunday, let's call it. Like yeah. It. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. There you go. I never think of that before. CEO <laughs> Sunday. Yeah. It sounds so good. <laughs> well, look, I think we better wrap things up. Um, uh, Greg, your program is called, the piano express and your studio is called the piano express but it's all to be found at grouplessons.com am i right yes fantastic and there are a heap of resources over there uh to go and explore um and daniel you are over at growyourmusicstudio.com i think most people are aware mm -hmm. of that so we'll put links to all yeah. this in our show notes um any sort of final comments before we wrap things up greg i would say just adding to what daniel said um about taking care of yourself and managing stress sometimes the best thing you can do for yourself is to make a change you know uh there's mm -hmm. going to be people that are listening to this podcast they came to this because they saw that we're going to talk about group lessons and you know that you know group lessons is something that it's the right thing for you it might be stressful to think about the change it might be stressful to pull the trigger but everything after that is better because you've done the right thing for yourself I and i think sometimes that. taking care of yourself you have to hold your breath jump into the deep end of the pool. I've had to do this a few times in my career. I've had to make changes that before I made it, I was just like, you know, nervous about it. But but after it was done, because I knew it was the right thing for me, I've never looked back. Quite right about things up. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Greg and Daniel. Appreciate you both. Thanks, Tim.